Hello, you're watching the press preview. It's a first look at Monday's front pages. And in the next 20 minutes or so, we'll see what's making the headlines with Annabelle Denham and Zoe Williams. Chat to them in a moment. First of all, let's check out those front pages for you. We're going to start with the Metro. It highlights a paratrooper photographed with a baby at Kabul Airport, uh, who featured actually in one of Stuart Ramsey's reports here on Sky News. The headline the Metro have gone with, I was just doing my duty. The Financial Times leads on the developing story in Afghanistan, announcing that the Prime Minister is set to hold crisis talks following the US retreat. And the Mail pictures the chaos of Kabul's airport, saying Boris Johnson plans to plead with Joe Biden. Their headline, Don't Cut and Run Yet, Joe. The Express leads with these same crisis talks. Their front, time running out for trapped Britons. Well, The Telegraph reports Downing Street hopes the G7 will focus on the long-term outlook for Afghanistan as well as the current evacuation efforts. The front of the eye also looks at the British response to the US withdrawal from Afghanistan with the headline, Rift Grows with US Over Afghan Withdrawal. The Guardian says Boris Johnson will plea with Joe Biden to keep US troops on the ground in Afghanistan. Well, the Times leads on the continuing chaos in Kabul, citing growing fears of an ISIS attack at the airport, something President Biden mentioned earlier. And the Star has good news for staycationers, with 12 days of hot weather forecast, including highs of 27 degrees. And I'm joined by Annabelle Denham and Zoe Williams. Uh, great to see you this Sunday evening. Thanks for being with us. Um, Zoe, why don't we start with the front of the Metro then? Uh, that image there of the uh, paratrooper holding uh, a little baby uh, filmed by our Sky News crew at uh, Kabul Airport. And it does sum things up, really, doesn't it? Especially the incredible work uh, that the paras are doing out there. Um, they've told Stuart Ramsey, our chief correspondent, that uh, it, it's harder than what they've seen and experienced on previous tours they've been on in Afghanistan. And really, we, uh, we, we need to have a, a huge amount of respect for them. Quite. And I, and I think um, the, the thing is, there are a huge amount of really harrowing stories coming out of Kabul, um, many of them kind of lighting on these parents, desperate parents, who are having to pass their children over to strangers. I mean, granted, paratrooper strangers, but strangers, just to get them out. And, it's re and it really brings home just the kind of lack of preparation there's been for this moment. You know, there's, it's like... It's the, the, the kind of time span between Trump's agreement, Biden's acceptance of the agreement and Biden's strategy for withdrawal was so long. And yet there was absolutely the, the things are happening minute by minute that are not foreseen in any of those plans. And it does land on the heads of these individual paratroopers, as you say, who are doing impossible work trying to help people and not knowing how long that help will continue and what is left for the people left behind. Yeah, and uh, the work uh, that they are doing, they're really up against the clock, um, aren't they, Annabelle? And uh, a lot of talk today about whether this deadline of uh, August the 31st can be extended just to give them more time to get more people out. I mean, do you see that being feasible? We know that the, uh, the G7 are going to meet virtually on Tuesday. Um, it's going to be discussed. Can it happen? I mean, I think that there's no option but for it to happen, that Joe Biden set a deadline for the 31st of August to begin with was quite clearly unrealistic. And I think that the US president has accepted now that, you know, the American strategy of no man left behind is going to come first. They are going to have to evacuate uh, US citizens and bring them back to US soil. Um, and I don't think they've really got much choice but to do that. But of course, over the course of this week, we've heard about the thousands of US citizens who are still in Kabul, who are still in Afghanistan. There's a huge amount of work to be done. So I think when it comes to the sorts of discussions that our leaders are going to have in the coming days and weeks, this, this should be a relatively straightforward one. Yeah, let's look at the front of the Daily Mail uh, then, uh, shall we, Zoe? Uh, Don't cut and run yet, Joe, is their headline. Uh, amid fears there may only be two days left to get refugees out of Afghanistan, the PM uh, pleads with Biden. Uh, there have been talk that uh, uh, the UK operation may finish 
uh, in the next couple of days or so. But let's hope that it can continue. But what is particularly worrying uh, is that President Biden tonight saying, uh, when he addressed the US public, that there is a real security threat now at the airport. So not only have you got to worry about people being crushed, running out of food and water, trying to get on the planes, but also you've got to worry about ISIS. Well, I mean, that was inevitable, though, wasn't it? As soon as you, as soon as you broke uh, agreement with the Taliban on this kind of rather flimsy basis that they would themselves try and stamp out terrorism when they have the same agenda in many ways as Al Qaeda and ISIS that followed, of course they weren't going to be any kind of um, barrier between the government of. Afghanistan and the terrorist elements within it. So that's not at all surprising. And furthermore, it shouldn't come as a surprise to either Biden or Johnson, because it was said by many of their civil servants beforehand, for many months beforehand. Um, the, the, the point is that, I mean, I feel that the British media is sort of throwing this, it's sort of framing this as though the British are begging the Americans to think harder and be more considered. Whereas I think from the international community's perspective, both the British and the Americans should have thought harder and been more considered before we got to this date. The, the, um, if Americans lose control by leaving Kabul airport, then there will not be an obvious safe route out for the people left yeah. there, whether they're British citizens, US citizens, or indeed Afghan citizens who have helped the Allied forces to, to the extent that they would be persecuted after the withdrawal. So it doesn't strike me as at all plausible for Biden to keep on with the deadline as it stands. Um, the problem is, as you said in your bulletin, that the Taliban representative has said that there'll be problems from their end if the deadline isn't respected. What those problems would look like, considering they've already rescinded on four out of five of the terms agreed with Trump, is yet to be seen, um, but it's certainly going to get worse before it gets better. Yeah, it's a good point. And, and let's put that to Annabelle, because we're seeing these bizarre, bizarre images of, of, uh, of US forces working with the Taliban outside the airport. I mean, images that we would never have thought were, were possible, but it's clearly a, a, a fragile truce at the moment and it can't last forever. No, exactly. It's quite interesting that on the cover of one newspaper, you've got this unholy alliance between uh, UK, US troops and the Taliban. And on the others, you've got stories about a rift between or developing rift between uh, the UK and the US and the future of the special relationship really being thrown into peril. I mean, when it comes to sort of perhaps the longer term prospects, and I I'd be very surprised if we do see terrorist activity in the coming days, because I think it simply isn't in the Taliban interest it isn't in the interest of a lot of people um, who would be kind of belligerent um, potential terrorists in Afghanistan at the moment I think what they need uh, is for things to remain as peaceful as possible uh, at least in the very short term until there's a full withdrawal of troops and after then there'll there'll be a decision for Taliban leaders to make which is are they going to impose Sharia law are they going to go back to uh, the era of pre 2001 are they going to harbor terror terrorists and the like, or are they actually going to try and make themselves a serious player on the world stage? Are they going to forge uh, stronger relationships with Russia and China, for instance? So, it, it, yeah, it's very interesting, but nonetheless unsettling times ahead. And I agree with Zoe that things are going to get worse before they get better, unfortunately. Yeah, and that leads us very nicely uh, onto the front of the Financial Times, uh, Zoe. Crisis talks as Russia and China are drawn into the uh, Afghan Aftermath. Uh, Boris Johnson um, obviously hosting these talks as, uh, 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 as we've been saying on Tuesday. But of course, China and Russia are going to be vital, aren't they, uh, as, we, as we look to the future? Well, this was something that came up a lot in the emergency parliamentary debate last Wednesday. That actually the UK, as the head, as the lead on the G7 this year, and as a, such a key player in NATO, should have been building these international bridges and strategies for months in advance. And the fact that they're starting now, as a, apparently in response to that emergency parliamentary debate, is just chilling. You know, it really suggests government done on a shoestring by, by the seat of its pants. So 
it's it's difficult to see the UK taking the same leadership role as it would have done if it had assumed that role in a timely and um, reputable manner. Nevertheless, you're completely right. There, there, there is no there is no unilateral response to the situation in Afghanistan unless it's a forever war waged by the UK or the US against the nation. You know, there is, it, it has to be bilateral. It has to be international in order for anything constructive to take place. Um, it's, it's quite, there's a question mark over what Russia's role will be in building that constructive response given how um, given how invested it's been of late in creating instability abroad rather than solving it yeah and uh, just before we go to the break um, Annabelle it'd be interesting to get your thoughts on uh, Joe Biden obviously speaking once again to the US public uh, this evening but polls are showing that his approval ratings are sliding to new lows do you think this has all meant that the honeymoon with the American people is over uh, yes, I mean, absolutely. I think what's really interesting is that if you looked at polling from April this year, around 69% of Americans were in favour of withdrawing US troops from Afghanistan. But that's changed drastically, um, you know, with the hasty uh, retreat uh, that we've seen in the recent uh, weeks. And I think that Americans are taking a more isolationist stance. Of course they are. And Joe Biden is driving that forward with America first. And I think that even though that there is that sort of overriding kind of emotion that they have over in the US at the moment in the public, um, actually what they hate more is to lose. And at the moment, you cannot shake the feeling that the US are, are losing this war. Um, there are a lot of accusations being leveled at uh, the US, at the US president, and indeed NATO um, and other yeah, members of the alliance, um, that we are, we have spent, you know, trillions of dollars on this war. Thousands of lives have been lost and very very little has been gained. So it's really no wonder that Joe Biden is uh, sliding, his approval ratings are dipping. They were, of course, very high for the sort of first hundred days and beyond of his presidency. And I, I, I don't think they're, that they're going to uh, tick upwards anytime soon. OK, Annabelle, Zoe, stay where you are, uh, if you would. Uh, coming up, the Financial Times looks at the gender pay gap with a headline that claims women on boards of UK blue chip companies are paid 40% less than men. Discussing that and more in a couple of minutes. Welcome back. Part two of the press preview. Annabelle and Zoe still with me. Um, let's have a look at the front page of the Financial Times. Annabelle, why don't you kick things off? Um, this is shocking, isn't it? Some blue chip companies paying 40% less to women than to men on the board. Well, the headline is shocking, and unfortunately, it's not the first time that I've seen a misleading headline like this in relation to gender pay gaps. The explanation for this gender pay gap is actually on the cover of the Financial Times itself. It's that women hold fewer of the higher paying top jobs, such as chair, independent director, or head of committee roles. Why would you pay somebody the same or even more if they are holding a junior role that might have less responsibilities or be less demanding in other ways? Um, I have no qualms with the Hampton Alexander review nor the Davies review that came before that. I think that, you know, higher female representation uh, can mean more, more role models for young girls and be positive in other ways. But what I'm very wary of is moving the goalposts. So the Davies review set um, a target of 20% on FTSE 100, uh, 350 companies. Um, the Hampton Alexander review set 33% target. So you can see how the goalposts are moving. My other concern is around unfair castigation of those companies that don't achieve uh, the representation, female representation on board. Um, that has been set and that can later down the line create commercial damage and as I said at the start it's it's not that they are paying men and women differently to do the same job it's because they are doing different roles that may be uh, yeah. you know, different in attractiveness. So maybe Zoe the problem is <laughs> are you itching to say something I can see but maybe the problem is that not enough women are being recruited for those top roles. I mean, obviously, when you look at a pay differential and then you say, well, this is because women don't have such have such demanding jobs, then you're looking at a pipeline problem because there's no inherent reason why men should have all the high-paying jobs unless women are being blocked from applying and 
and gaining them. So I think the, the notion that like women are somehow choosing to do less well-paid work is, is for the birds. Furthermore, though, I mean, there, there are problems with these blue chip companies in the pay of their top ex executives. You know, I disagree with the whole, with the entire pay structure in which the, the, the entire bottom strata of the company is outsourced minimum wage labor and the chief exec is getting 1.5 million pounds in the first place. So there are really, really significant things to tackle. Um, that that is female access through the pipeline, pay differentials within the organisation, outsourcing, and um, you know, really systemic low pay failure of progression at the bottom. Mm. And I think we do ourselves a disservice, and we do you know the, the corporate world in general a disservice when we fixate on quite a small strata of the workforce and its inequalities without kind of looking at what conditions are like across the piece. Okay. Uh, we've only got about a minute left, and I want to get in uh, one more story at least. Uh, this is a bit worrying, Annabelle, isn't it? The flu jab uh, may not work as well this year because we've been so preoccupied with COVID. Yes, it's very concerning indeed. My primary worry, Jonathan, is actually that we are going to see a spike in flu cases. Um, we're not going to be prepared uh, to deal with that. We're going to see increased pressure on the NHS and the government is going to be tempted or pressured into introducing more restrictions. And they won't be coronavirus restrictions. There'll be restrictions due to the NHS backlog or due to a bad flu season. I think that that would set a very dangerous precedent. Freedom must be the default and we cannot have the government imposing restrictions on our movements, forcing us to wear face masks or socially distance because we need to shield the NHS. I think that sets a very dangerous precedent indeed. Right, OK. Um, well, flu may be kept at bay over the next few days at least. Front of the Daily Star, uh, Zoe. A uh, heat wave is on the way, although it says temperatures could reach an incredible 27 degrees Celsius. I mean, that's just normal August weather, isn't it, or what it should be? This is a story I wanted to spend all half hour on because I'm so excited. I mean, when they say heat wave, obviously it's not the heat wave that we've known by by that by that term in other months and other years. It's it's not been a great summer, and it certainly hasn't been a great summer when most people have been kind of have had to stay in the UK for their holidays. Yeah, but yeah. it is yeah. a lovely way to go out, right? Yeah, we all need some sun. It's due to a hot air blob, apparently. Uh, Annabelle, Zoe, thank you both very much indeed. We'll speak again in uh, half an hour.